Hello, my name is Tracy Chalmers and I am with Wellkind. And I'm excited to introduce Shad Gosi. We're gonna tell a little bit about Wellkind first. Uh, Wellkind is an organization that is committed to nature, to the environment, and doing what we can to preserve it in every way. Uh, I'm the community organizer and the school garden educator here at Wellkind. And our mission is to give local leaders a voice. We partner with these organizations in order to cultivate economic and ecological wellness for their communities and for the earth. See, these partnerships are very important to us. People ask us, why do we do that? It's because we care. We care and we know that there are more people on the ground that already have established relationships that can do a lot. And so we work with these organizations also. Um, we do this through school garden programs as well as community gardens and school gardens. Uh, this year, Wellkind will provide garden mini grants to schools and to communities to start or maintain a garden. As some of you out there, I know, have received your letter saying that um, we have an agreement with you to provide funds to help you with your garden. It's very exciting. So it was great to hear back from you, a lot of you this morning with that. We know the hands-on experience to cultivate the love of nature will instill a lifelong interest for children and for adults everywhere. So once again, I'm excited to introduce Shad Gosi as our guest speaker for Seeds of Change. And Shad is a passionate farmer a designer and a permaculturist, which is what you'll be hearing more about today. He's lived and worked in Guatemala for 12 years, and he'll tell you a little bit about that, about his passion. And he is also the program director of Wellkind in Guatemala. Without further ado, Shad Gosi. Hi, Shad. Hey, Teresi. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to everyone tuning in from wherever you're coming in from. Uh, it's great to see so many so many people uh, here participating. So I'm uh, really looking forward to the next hour that we have together. Um, yeah, just to follow up a little bit, give a tiny bit more background about myself. Uh, my name is Shad. I am uh, originally from the United States, from New Jersey, uh, but I've been here in the Western Highlands of Guatemala uh, with my wife for the past 13 years. Uh, when we first came down here, we, within a year or two, started a small scale, uh, but highly diversified permaculture inspired organic farm. We focus on salad greens and other mixed vegetables, um, chicken, uh, chicken for meat and also for eggs, and then a lot of fruit trees, a plant nursery and a bunch of other things like that. Um, and also began teaching permaculture uh, which we'll try to spend a teeny bit of time on uh, today, about 10 years ago. So I've certified well over a thousand people in permaculture design over my years of teaching and taught many more than that. I've taught in uh, both English and in Spanish all through uh, the United States and Central America. Um, and about two years ago, I began working with Wellkind, uh, which is an amazing nonprofit that is really just empowering local leaders, as Teresi said, uh, to, to get their communities access to healthy food, connection to the earth, access to land to grow gardens. So it's something I'm really super proud to be a part of Wellkind. Uh, and yes, as I, as Teresi mentioned, uh, for the past few years have been the program director of Wellkind Guatemala, which is uh, all of the programs that Wellkind has going on here in the Western Highlands uh, where I live. So we, we dedicate a lot of our time to family gardens, community gardens, school gardens, but also to reforestation, training and education, uh, building local economy through farmers markets, through seed saving initiatives, uh, a bunch of stuff like that. And I think at the end of this, we'll get a little more uh, update from myself and from Teresi, how everyone who's listening can maybe get involved or support the work that we're doing, because it really is amazing stuff. Um, but today I really, I, this is the third, uh, the third and final uh, event in our three series, three part series webinar. Uh, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on permaculture and kind of open up with maybe a little bit of like theoretical and uh, hopefully inspirational stuff of, of why it's important to start to understand where your food comes from and to have a different story maybe that challenges the modern sort of um, narrative that humans are bad for the landscape. So I wanted to spend a teeny bit of time on that. And that will also involve 
defining permaculture uh, and then uh, looking briefly at the permaculture design principles, which are what I consider the kind of crux or the core of permaculture design. So we'll do that. Uh, and then we'll actually leave a little space for some questions. So at any point during this, this webinar, if you have any questions, I won't see them immediately. I'm gonna focus on what I'm talking about, but feel free to drop your questions in the chat. And then at the two different times when we have uh, q and I'll be able to go through them and hopefully get a chance to respond to your questions. So, so let them come, uh, don't hold back and hopefully we'll get to get through all of them. Uh, after the theoretical and inspirational part with a little q and I'm then going to dive into some really hyper practical tips of gardening that people can do anywhere in the world. You don't need land, you don't need fancy gardening equipment to do this sort of stuff. You can do it in a pot that you found in the trash with some soil that you uh, dug up, you know, from anywhere. Uh, and you can really start to experience the abundance of nature, even on a, on a concrete driveway or in land that's not yours, that you maybe have permission to spend a little bit of time there, or even in an apartment uh, in a sunny windowsill. So these, these tips are designed for anyone, kind of hopefully regardless of, of what access to tools and land you have at your fingertips. Um, and it's a good way to get started. Uh, it costs no money and it really does empower you to see the abundance of nature and how easy it actually is to grow, grow food. So uh, without further ado, I want to get into it. Um, and I'm curious, uh, just, you know, it, it, feel free to put anything in the chat that you'd like. Uh, but if people have heard of permaculture, uh, maybe you have heard of it, maybe you've gotten a certification, maybe you never heard the word and you're just like perma what, you know, and you're like, what the heck is that? Uh, so permaculture is, uh, it's a, it's, I consider it more than anything, a social movement, but it's also a, a, a design uh, pedagogy. It's a, it's a way of designing uh, holistic systems. And so usually permaculture is applied to gardening and to resource and land management. But I always encourage people to, to think of permaculture as a design system that can be applied to any aspect of your life. So this can be applied to your garden, but it could also be applied to your office or to your kitchen or even to like a process that you want to work on internally. Maybe you want to make a change in your life, uh, start doing something that you're currently not doing, or stop doing something that maybe is no longer serving you. And so these permaculture design principles, which I'm going to show you in a second, are really a great way to approach change in any form. So change in your garden, change in your setting and your physical landscape, whether it's an apartment or a work setting, a classroom, or even inside your body, uh, a sort of mental or energetic change. So these are really powerful principles. Uh, but before we dive into them, I just want to give a tiny little history and a bit of definitions of permaculture. So the word permaculture was actually coined in Australia uh, by two people named Bill Mollison and David Holmgren uh, in like 1972, I want to say. And they really, what they did was they smushed the words permanent and agriculture. They just smushed them together and got this word permaculture. And it's like a fun word to say. It kind of like bubbles off your tongue, permaculture. It's like, you know, it's nice and happy. Uh, and it has come to really stand for this idea of like regenerative, sustainable agriculture. Um, what, the way I like to think of permaculture uh, is that we're, it's really mimicking functional ecosystems. So it's really asking, hey, how does a forest work? And what is a forest doing when, you know, we can answer that. We can say, look, you know, farm, forest doesn't produce any waste. It cycles nutrients. It cleans the air. It cleans the water. It provides food and habitat for everything that lives inside the forest. And so we model the functionality of a naturally occurring ecosystem. And we build that into human built systems. And so another way to think of it is that permaculture is all about designing ecosystems that feed us, that meet human needs. And as simple as it sounds, it actually is quite a profound idea, this idea of, of designing or creating ecosystems. And I had a teacher a long time ago who, who kind of shared some stories with me. And he, he, I had an aha moment when I was listening to him. Uh, he basically said that, hey, you know, 
if you look at the textbook definition of an ecosystem, an ecosystem is uh, the interaction of the biological or the living components and the non-biological or the non-living components, the interactions between and within those things that give rise to certain patterns. Now in the science and maybe the ecology that we may have studied in, in fifth or sixth or eighth or ninth grade, uh, that pattern would often be described as the dominant tree species. So it might be like, okay, the interaction of the non-living components, like the amount of rain and the type of soil and uh, the slope and all these different things mixed with the biological components, like these types of seeds and these types of bacteria and these types of fungi give rise to a pattern that is oaks or pine trees or redwoods. And so that's the typical understanding of an ecosystem. It's the interactions of the non-living and living things that give rise to a predictable pattern. And what I understood when I had, when I, when this clicked for me was like humans are creating ecosystems all the time. We're just really bad at it. So if you think about it, you know, uh, a football stadium is an ecosystem. You know, there's the living things like the pigeons and maybe some cockroaches and maybe some grass and a few trees in the parking lot and the humans. And then there's the non-living things like the, uh, the concrete and the cement and the iron and the parking lot and all this stuff. Uh, so we have all the components of an ecosystem, but we stop short of modeling and mimicking how a functional ecosystem in nature would work to get all these emergent properties, all these real benefits. And so permaculture really invites us to ask this question, hey, how can, we, how can we mimic the functionality of a natural ecosystem in any and all of our designs? Now to go a teeny bit deeper here, what I really like is that permaculture has this philosophy, has an underlying worldview that I think is very inspirational. And it's almost like a bit of medicine that's really timely in the current kind of moment we find ourselves in, in our culture, where we have a uh, sort of ecological threatening future. We don't know what's in store, but we know it's not currently looking very good. The ecological reality that our children are inheriting um, we have a, a lot of challenges with species loss, with uh, access to healthy uh, food, to clean water, to, um, to clean air. And so really, uh, I have found that there's a dominant cultural narrative that basically says that humans are bad for the planet. And I don't like that. I don't like that story. I don't like that belief. I don't think that humans are bad for the planet. And you see it, it kind of makes its way everywhere. There's like stories that say the cow is bad for the planet, that they're responsible for global warming. Well, I don't think that a cow is definitely just bad, right? Maybe the way it's currently forced to live is generally not good for the ecology and the environment, but that doesn't mean the cow is bad. And I would make the same argument for the human, that the human is actually an amazingly beneficial and positive force for the environment if the human is enabled and empowered to act in a certain way. But when removed from a healthy way of being, it can have an impact. Yeah. So my favorite definition of permaculture to kind of wrap up this part is basically that uh, there's a quote by Penny Livingston Stark, who's a permaculture practitioner in California. And she, she says to everyone, hey, how many people have heard of the idea to uh, minimize your footprint? You have to minimize your footprint. This is like a real environmentalist favorite, you know, like minimize your footprint. But how does that make you feel? You know, how would, it, how would you feel if you came over to visit me and I was like, hey, hey, you know, Christina, come on into my house, just, minimize your footprint you'd be like wow shad's not really that nice you know and how does that advice make me feel it makes me feel like i have to tiptoe like i have to make myself as small as possible and do as little damage as possible and so i think that idea of minimizing our footprint kind of captures this narrative that is being told to us that humans are bad for the planet and i just think there's no way we can ever have a beneficial impact if from the beginning we're being told that we are bad for the planet. And so what Penny Livingston Stark says is like, hey, let's challenge that. Let's change that a little. Instead of saying minimize our footprint, let's say optimize our footprint. 
And what that means for me is that our needs are valid. Everyone has a need for healthy, acts, healthy food. Everyone has a need for clean water, for clean air. Uh, everyone has a need for, for dignified shelter and dignified livelihood. So we shouldn't try to minimize these needs. We should just try to optimize the way that we meet them. So she says, optimize your footprint. And then when that's done, maximize your handprint. And that part may be as scary to an environmentalist who may believe that any activity that a human does is uh, bad for the environment but we don't necessarily believe that as permaculturalists. There's lots of things that we can do to maximize our handprint that leave the ecosystem better than when we found it. That could be planting trees that you'll never harvest, maybe working at the top of a watershed to hold water high in an area. Maybe it's encouraging the, the, the uh, return of native species in your area. Uh, there's so many different ways that humans can have real positive beneficial impacts on the planet. And so I think it really starts for me with challenging the idea that humans are bad for the planet and then saying, well, if that's not true, then how can humans behave so that we are ecologically in alignment, that we're actually forces for diversification and beautification and enhanced uh, functionality of these support systems of all life. So what, with that all said, I want to share my screen now and I want to show you guys the 12 permaculture principles. Um, to me, these 12 permaculture principles really form a framework. Uh, they form a framework that can help you make decisions that are both ethical and ecological. And in fact, if you see right under where it says the 12 principles of permaculture, uh, it says that it's adapted from Dave Holmgren's principles, which can be found at permacultureprinciples.com. David Holmgren is one of the two founders of the word and the movement permaculture. Uh, and one of his definitions is, in fact, that permaculture is a framework for making ethical and ecological decisions. And when he says that, I'm instantly reminded of these 12 principles. These principles are that framework. And I almost look at them as like a checklist. So if I'm designing a garden or maybe I'm going to build a little chicken house or maybe I'm going to redesign my kitchen or something like that, I might run through these 12 principles and make sure that I'm kind of in alignment with each one. And what you'll find is most ideas kind of uh, support most of the principles, but usually an idea that, that isn't so ecologically sound will create a red flag on one or two of these principles. So they are a, a checklist and a framework that guides you towards making decisions that are both ethical and ecological in nature. So I just want to go through uh, and share a few of these. Um, we have number one, which is observe and interact. And I think this is really important because it reminds us that it's the world is not like software. The natural world is not this sort of like plug and play. All operating systems are the same. You just do it all, all, you know, it's the same anywhere you go. So this reminds us, you know, one of my favorite things to say about this is that the landscape is the textbook. So it all starts good, high quality design starts with observation and small, tiny interactions. So this deep observation really informs us of how things are moving around the area that we want to design, uh, what, what sort of uh, flows are happening, what things are happening throughout a year. Uh, there's a good permaculture piece of advice that says, before you do anything permanent, you should observe for one year. Now, we don't always have that luxury of time, but when possible, the longer you can observe before committing to something permanent, the better. Um, number two tells us to catch and store energy. Uh, and it's really interesting. We talk about energy a lot in permaculture. Uh, the sun is energy. And in fact, maybe you're noticing it as I'm, I'm kind of slowly shifting, you know, just in this, we in this webinar right now, I was not observant enough to, to, to realize that the sun's going to come through and start to blast me. So I'm slowly moving to, to stay out of the line of the sunlight. So the energy of the sun is something that is moving through our sight all the time. How can we catch and store the solar energy? How can we catch and store energy of wild animals or of people or of traffic? How can we catch and store energy of trash, financial energy, 
any number of things that might be flowing through the thing that we are trying to design are worthy of, of asking this question. How can we catch and store them? Or alternatively, uh, deflect them in an ethical way. Uh, number three encourages us to obtain a yield. Uh, so every system that you're designing should give a set of yields that you're not only identified as being able to produce, but defining a way that you can capture them and actually take advantage of them. If the fruit is on the tree, but you never harvest it, I would argue that that is not a yield. So the, in good permaculture design, it doesn't stop at just growing the fruit. It's also the design includes how do we harvest it? How do we process it? How do we make sure that it finds its way to the people who supported that system, who get to get the benefit of that yield? So, so thinking creatively about yields, but also practically about how to actually ob obtain them. Um, number four is one of my favorites. So I'm gonna spend a minute on this before moving on. Uh, applying self-regulation and accepting the feedback. So this to me is like the formula of design. So when we think about design, a lot of times people think, oh, I make this home design and, and then it's finished and it's done. But that's not really it. It's like, that's only one part of it. So you have to create a design and then you have to let it run a little bit. That's what we mean by applying self-regulation. So it's like, okay, let's redesign my watering system, for example, and then let's turn it on and we'll watch it for a couple of weeks. We'll use the watering system and see what happens. But at some point we have to accept the feedback. Okay. And when we accept the feedback, we need to also provide a way to take that feedback and, and bring it back into the design and adjust what uh, the things that were not really working for us. So I always have a little story here, like, you know, just a simple one, because it, it paints the picture. And we're always designing, we're always designing. Um, so for example, say I, I am, uh, I, I'm interested in maybe getting in better shape and eating pretty healthy. And so my first step, the, it, principle number one says observe and interact. It's like, okay, well, what I've observed is that when I leave the office at 5 p.m., I'm really hungry and there's a McDonald's between my office and my house. And I always stop and I get a Big Mac. And like, that's something I definitely don't want to do. So the first step of design is observing, observing that, hey, I'm hungry when I get out of the office and I want to eat a Big Mac. So I stop and eat a Big Mac, but I don't want that. So then what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to apply self-regulation. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to bring two bananas because bananas are way healthier than, than a Big Mac or two apples. But I'll say, let's take two bananas. So I put them in my car. I go into the office. I come out at 5 p.m. The bananas are there but they're all hot. They've been in the sun in the car all day. And they're just like kind of warm brown bananas. And no one likes a warm banana. So I take a bite of it. It's kind of gross. I, I don't eat it. And then I end up stopping for the Big Mac anyway. So that's the feedback. The feedback is I don't want a warm banana. And so I have to somehow modify the system. So I go home that night. I'm thinking about it. Ah, that was a gross banana. So then I decide, oh, I'm going to make extra dinner, some healthy dinner, and I'm gonna bring the leftovers into the office and put them in the office fridge. And then when I get out at five o'clock, I can have a little snack from my leftover dinner the night before, which is much healthier than a Big Mac. And then go home and then I won't have that urge to get a Big Mac. So that realization of the warm banana is for me the feedback. And so I always tell people when you're creating a design, no one gets it right in the beginning. There's always a warm banana. So you need to have a design process that allows you to be prepared for the warm banana and then have a flexibility enough to shift it and modify the original design to accept the feedback. So this is really important. I like to always encourage people because I think people feel set back when your first design doesn't work the way you want it to, but that's, that's just how it is. I think everyone has this. And so knowing that the warm banana is going to come, it encourages you to then find a creative solution for the feedback that the system's telling you. Um, going on a bit more, it, number five encourages the use of renewable and uh, uh, renewable and sustainable resources and services. So that one kind of is pretty self-explanatory. Number six encourages us to produce no waste. So anything that you're designing, if it's a little business, if it's your kitchen or anything, ask how can this system produce no waste? Uh, there's, everyone's probably heard of the three R's, 
but we also have the five R's in permaculture. So it's not just reduce, reuse, recycle, it's refuse. So no, thank you. I don't want that single use thing. So refuse, then reuse, reduce, repair, and then recycle. So repairing stuff is also another one of the R's. So permaculture gives us the refusal option and the repair option. Um, number seven is to design from the patterns down to the details. So really going back to number one, observation, observing the patterns that you're working with. If you're trying to redesign your morning routine, for example, to know the patterns of your body, of your mind, of the people that maybe live around you or in your, in your area, in your house. Uh, if you can be aware of those patterns before you determine all the little details, the design will be better. So starting from the broad patterns and then drilling down to the details. Um, number eight encourages us to integrate when possible. So always asking how can these two things be combined? Um, number nine is encouraging slow and small solutions. Uh, I think in our in the dominant industrial culture, we have this go big or go home attitude, but permaculture says, no, let's start uh, slow, small, also decentralized. Um, number 10 encourages the use of diversity, not putting all our eggs into one basket. Um, number 11 tells us to value the marginal, use the edges and value the marginal. Oftentimes the marginal, which is kind of the thing that's not like the rest, tends to get forced into being like the rest. It's like, oh, you're marginal, you're odd, you're, you're, you're the oddball. We're going to pretend you're not there or, or cover it up or something like that. But in permaculture, it says, no, the marginal is actually oftentimes the most useful or productive or diversifying potential of the system. So how do we value the marginal land, the marginal people, the marginal settings, the marginal parts of the day, for example? the marginal parts of our garden. So it encourages the creative use of these sorts of things. Um, number 12 tells us to creatively use and respond to change, which is a little bit of like, yeah, I, you know, that, that doesn't really leave me too satisfied. But I think by following the other 11, you put yourself in a position to be able to creatively use and respond to the changes that are always coming. So that was a quick little rundown of the permaculture principles. I'm going to stop my share before we go further. Um, and I just want to kind of say like, so basically um, the, the principles are this framework. And I would really encourage everyone uh, to, to get these principles in front of you, maybe write them down, spend a little bit of time thinking about like how, how you can apply these in your life. Maybe I used to keep them on a little piece of paper, just the 12 principles. And anytime I was working on anything, a garden or, or uh, even just in my re redesigning my day, I, on New Year's, around the New Year's time, I always take out the principles and I'm thinking about what I want to achieve the next year. And I look at the principles. It's a form of inspiration. Um, so we're about 30 minutes in. I want to just check and see. I see a few questions that came in. Um, so yeah, a few people noticed the marimba music. So right on uh, for, you know, a, a throw out to Guatemala, uh, which is where we are. And yeah, it does sound Greek. I never thought of that before. Um, some, someone asked, uh, where should someone go to get started with permaculture? Uh, well, just diving into these principles like we did is a great start. Um, Atitlan Organics has uh, permaculture trainings and I can share a link there. Uh, but just Googling around and, and uh, starting to Google permaculture, what is permaculture, you'll find a lot of stuff online. Uh, but most importantly, I would encourage you to plug into your local networks. Hopefully there's a community garden or a, a guild of gardeners or, or people that are working with the land wherever you're living. Uh, and if there's not, maybe you feel encouraged to start one, but going to local meetups, connecting with other people. I like to say that permaculture is the largest social movement in the world. They're literally on every continent, every country. People are talking about permaculture somewhere. Uh, so finding those people is another great way to get plugged in. Um, and what are good plants for beginners to start with? So that's what we're actually going to dive into now. Uh, so I, I'll leave that uh, pending. But in general, starting with a little vegetable garden is really easy. And kind of depending where you are, 
Growing leaves are really easy. So growing like Swiss chard or lettuce or kale or something like that is really easy. Uh, they're shorter and faster growing. So you don't have as long of a timeline for maybe illness or pests to come in. Uh, but also, again, depending on your area, the annual vegetables are, uh, don't cost much to start and get going. And then if you lose them, you don't really lose much, but some of your time. Um, there's a lot of reward that happens quickly, as opposed to a fruit tree, which you might have to wait three or four years uh, to get a result with. Um, so yeah, here we are. Uh, are there any, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna, gonna move forward. And um, now, so, so basically if I were to sum it up is that permaculture is, is uh, a framework for a holistic design. Using those 12 principles, we can start to bring in some of the functionality of ecosystems into our uh, environment, into our garden, into our house, into our lives, into our schedules. And, uh, and just understanding that it encourages us to say that humans are not necessarily bad for the planet. And in fact, if we think creatively how to observe, how to accept feedback, how to catch and store energy, how to produce no waste, there's always an option to do these things. And that would really help reestablish and redefi redefine the impact that humans have on the planet uh, and challenge that narrative that humans are only bad. Um, so to not just leave people with inspirational and sort of theoretical stuff, I wanted to dedicate the next part of this to some real practical gardening tips. So, um, so what I want to do is spend the last kind of 20, 25 minutes on uh, plant propagation. So plant propagation, if you're like, what is propagation? I don't even know what that is. Don't worry. What plant propagation means basically means how to make more of a plant. So how do you have a tomato plant? How do you propagate it? How do you make more tomato plants? Or you have a mint plant and you want more mint plants. And so to propagate a plant means to multiply it, means to create more of it. So that's what we really want to do. And I love this little line. Uh, uh, if anyone's read uh, uh, Walden by Thoreau, uh, Walden uh, is the story of, of the author, of the author uh, Thoreau kind of abandoning civilization, abandoning society and moving out to the woods, to the wild, to a nearby kind of lake in Massachusetts. And he basically says, I'm going to live off the wilderness. And at one point in the book, he decides to grow a patch of beans. And he basically says at one point to let the earth speak beans. And he eventually decides that it's not a worthwhile endeavor, which I don't agree with. Um, but I like this idea of letting the earth speak beans. And what I think if you get good with plant propagation, you almost become an organ for the earth to speak that you can really kind of paint landscapes with all these amazing plants for really no money. Because when you learn how to propagate plants in one afternoon, you can start 5,000 trees. It's really that simple. Uh, so letting the earth speak beans or perennial edible foodscapes that evolve over time because we don't have to just plant beans. Um, so what do you need? So really, you need only a few things. You need some potting soil. Now, the easiest is also the most expensive. The easiest is that you can just go down to a, a local garden shop and buy some potting soil. Uh, it's reusable, so uh, you can use it and then move the plants out and you have some leftover soil. You can uh, start new plants in that. But otherwise, uh, you can just get some sifted topsoil from your garden and 20% uh, compost. Uh, or less if you have decent soil. Um, and again, you can start with what you have around you. Uh, hopefully there'll be somewhere to get a little bit of soil, but even uh, a small bag of potting soil shouldn't cost too much money uh, if you don't have a place to, to harvest some of your own. Uh, it is good to sift it. Uh, it doesn't really matter how finely you sift it, but just to get any big roots or rocks or stones out of it. Um, so you need some potting soil. You need containers. So this could be old recycled bags, like maybe you buy a certain type of uh, like rice or some sort of thing in your kitchen that creates a plastic bag. You just put holes in it, drainage holes, and you have a planter bag. Or you could use 
uh, a soda bottle, a recycled bottle, cut off the top, put some holes in it. All the containers uh, need drainage so the water doesn't stay in there. So you put holes in them and the water can drain out. Anything that holds soils and baby plants. Uh, people use egg cartons, egg, the little egg container cells for small plants, uh, but anything and you can get real creative there. Uh, people tend to throw out a lot of old pots and planter pots and things like that. So most of this stuff can be recycled or found for free. If you're feeling fancy, you can get yourself a pair of pruning shears, but otherwise any pair of scissors should do just fine. I like to have a butter knife and a small sharp knife at, at, at my hand. Uh, and all of this stuff can kind of be set up at a little sunny spot by a window in your apartment. Or if you're going to put it outside, it's, not, it's nice to not let this stuff get rained on. So ideally under the eave of a building, or maybe you throw up a little plastic sort of uh, um, rooftop or a piece of tin roofing or something like that. A spray bottle's nice, but not required. You just need a water source to keep the plants moist. Uh, and the space should be at least in partial sun and somewhat protected from the rain. And then lastly, in order to get your propagation material, you need mature plants or seeds. Um, so there you go, you don't need much. Most of these things can be found around your house. Uh, and so very little money, if any, needs to be spent to get everything you need to start propagating plants. So really, I wanna mention there's two types of plant propagation. We have sexual propagation, which is basically seeds. So seeds are the product of plant sex. Uh, usually um, the seed will always offer new genetic diversity. So because it's like the reason I don't look exactly like my mother or exactly like my father is because I am a new representation of the mixed genetics that my mom and dad had. So similarly, the seeds are the offspring of the two parent plants and those plants mix their genetics and the seed has the opportunity to present new genetic diversity. So this is interesting um, from a plant perspective to encourage more diversity, uh, to encourage uh, uh, new characteristics that might be desirable. Um, seeds are slower, uh, they're more delicate to plant, they take longer time uh, and so they're I would say in that sense, a little bit less preferred than the asexual plant propagation methods, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, obtaining seeds is the mark of a good gardener and it doesn't usually cost money. It usually requires observation, observing plants in your garden or in your friend's garden or at a community garden and noting the one that has really good characteristics that you want. like oh, that one's really resistant to the bug that seems to be eating all of its neighbors. Or, oh, that one's really resistant to the disease that seems to be affecting all its neighbors. Or, oh, that one has fruit that's twice as big as all its neighbors. That's the seed I want. So obtaining good seeds really starts with observation of what's happening with the plants that you're observing. Um, going from there, uh, saving seeds is, is the way to get your seed. Uh, so if you're not sure of this, this is always worth pointing out. It always goes in this order, the flower first. So the plant flowers, and then if there's a fruit, the fruit will form. And then inside the fruit or the seed pod, the, 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 the dried flower will be the seed. So the flowers first. So if you see a big bright flower, you know that if you come back in a couple of days, that flower will have kind of withered and inside the flower, usually at the base, there'll be the seed forming. So the order is flower, then the fruit, if there is one, then the seed. Saving seeds from your microclimate is the best way to improve your seed collection. So if you're not sure where to start, yeah, go online and order some seeds from wherever you can get them from. But ideally over time, you'd be able to save seeds that are growing in your area or ideally from a local seed producer in your sort of bio region. Um, you know, I'm gonna save this talk of heirloom versus hybrid versus GMO to make sure uh, we can get through the other stuff. But in short, uh, uh, heirloom seed is something that you can save the seed generation after generation, and it should be the same. 
So if you have a, a beautiful bean and you save the seed of that plant and you plant that seed, it'll give you another bean that's the same style, taste, appearance, more or less. A hybrid is, is the result of a mix of two parent plants. And oftentimes the seed that that offspring gives you will actually resemble a parent plant, like the grandparent more than it's, than it's like mother plant, so to speak. So hybrids are harder to save over and over again, but they can be saved. And genetically modified organisms are kind of a whole different class. Uh, for me, the ge genetically modified organism means that it's a, it's a seed that contains a gene, or one or more genes, from something that's not in the same family or genus. So if you have a, you know, if you're a tomato that has a gene from a bacteria, that would be considered a genetically modified organism. Whereas a hybrid is, is just one tomato mixing with another tomato and you get this offspring. Uh, and we can get more into that. There's usually a lot of questions, but I don't wanna spend too much time on that piece here. And then just in general, uh, if you start saving your seeds, uh, you are starting to impart your preferences on the plant lineage. And that's a really fascinating thing. You know, if you like big tomatoes that are less acidic and you start saving the tomato seeds from the big tomatoes that are not quite as acidic as the neighboring plants, over time, you get your own sort of lineage of tomatoes that are less acidic. And that lack of acidity is representative of your uh, preferences being imparted on the plant. So you start to see that even in a tiny garden, you can start to observe and interact with plants over generations and start to really form these deep relationships, which is something amazing and speaks to that idea that humans don't necessarily have to be bad for the planet. And in fact, one would argue that the incredible diversity that we're now losing came about through gardeners from many, many thousands of years, imparting their preferences and their microclimate restrictive uh, climactic factors onto the set of food plants and medicinal plants that they use. And over time, getting this rich tapestry, this rich diversity of seeds, um, that's all a, a beautiful implementation of human ingenuity to enhance diversity in the environment. Um, let's move on now. So that was all seeds. Seeds are sexual plant propagation, but we actually have four other types of plant propagation that are, uh, that are um, four types of propagation that are asexual, that don't result from pollination and don't require seeds to deal with. So for example, uh, we have um, asexual propagation is faster so even if you could save the seeds of something, you actually may choose to do an asexual propagation method because it's quicker and you don't have to deal with these tiny little seeds and wait for the plant to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, one of the drawbacks of asexual propagation is it's a clone. It's a clone. So it's actually just a, a genetically identical to the mature mother plant that you propagate from. So this isn't necessarily bad, but if you are interested in plant diversity, you may want to save some seeds when possible. Um, I want to go to this piece now. So this, we have about 10 minutes. So I want to leave you with this sort of practical way to figure out how to propagate plants, even if you don't know what they are. So this is really what I call propagating plants using your intuition, okay? And so what this does is it teaches us to have a dialogue with the plant. So the first thing you wanna do, you see a new plant, it's in front of you, you're like, wow, this plant is super interesting. So the first thing you wanna ask the plant is, hi plant, what's the most interesting thing about you? What are you trying to tell me? Oftentimes it'll be a flower, maybe it'll be the color of the leaves, Maybe it'll be thorns on the stems, but it'll have some characteristic. And whatever your attention is drawn to, that's an observation and it's valid. So you're out there listening now. The first thing you wanna do when you see a plant, you don't, it's so tempting to say, oh, what plant is this? What's your name? But you don't wanna ask what its name. You don't wanna use one of those plant app identifiers. You don't wanna go on Google. 
you want to stop and you just want to observe. And instead of saying, what is your name or what are you? Maybe just say, hey, what's interesting about you? What part of you is, is calling my attention? So this is key to understanding plants, asking this question of, hey, what's the most interesting thing about you? Um, if it is a flower or a fruit or a seed that you're seeing that's calling your attention, that's the plant telling you, hey, look, the flower is the most interesting thing or the fruit is the most interesting thing or this big old seed. And if that's telling you that, it's telling you, hey, use sexual propagation, save my seed. So if the most interesting or known thing about a plant is the flower, the fruit, or the seed, you wanna start with the seed. As said before, you don't wanna look for a seed in the br bright, uh, fresh flower that just opened up. You wanna look for it in the dried flower, in the seed pod, or in the mature fruit. And then again, this is all super intuitive. If the seed is like, I call it human scale. Can you hold it in your hand? Can you see it? Or is it so tiny that you're not even sure it's a seed? If it's human scale, that means you can hold it. You can put them in your hand and see them and kind of pick them up individually. Even if they're small, you're pretty sure it's a seed. Then that's a sign that, hey, you can plant the seed and it'll grow. But a lot of things will have these little specks of dust and you're not even sure if they're seeds. That to me is not human scale. And that is the plant telling you, hey, even though my flower was interesting, there's probably some other way to propagate me that's easier. So I'm gonna do this with some repetition to hopefully drive these points home. So the first thing you see when you see a new plant, you say to it, hey plant, what's the most interesting thing about you? And if it happens to be a flower or a fruit or a seed, you wanna look for the seed. And if it's human scale, you know you can just plant it. And that's literally as simple as taking some potting soil, filling up the bag that you recycled and put the seed in. You usually wanna put it about twice as deep as it is big. So if it's that big, you put it twice as deep and, and keep it watered and it will grow. But maybe you don't find a seed. And so now you know you're in the, in the realm of asexual propagation. So if there's no human scale seed or no flower or no fruit that gives you a seed, then the next question to ask the plant is, are you woody and upright? Are you woody and upright? Is that how you're growing? And so plants that are woody and growing upright are, uh, are generally telling us that we could take a cutting. Some other tertiary questions might be, are you a vine? If it's a vining plant, a plant that's growing up in a vining manner, or if they have milky sap, if you break a leaf off or cut the stem a little and has milky sap, that's also a sign that, that you can take a cutting. So you say, what's the most interesting thing about you? If it's not a fruit, flower, or a seed, or maybe it is, but you don't find a seed, the next question is, are you woody and upright? And if that's the case, you can take a cutting. So um, for the sake of time, I won't get into all the details here, but really you wanna make sure that your cuttings are at least two to four inches long and can be much taller than that. Uh, three nodes and a node, if you can see my cursor here, the nodes of the plant are where the leaves or smaller stems branch off from the main stem. So this is a node, that would be one. This would be another node where he, the person is, is breaking it off. And that would be a third node. So your cutting should have at least three nodes and should be at least two to four inches long. You remove all but the top one or two pairs of the leaves and then you put it in some soil and keep it watered for approximately one month and that cutting will grow. So I'm thinking of things like mulberries basically grow anywhere in the world. Uh, their seeds, that are non-existent, they're really tiny. So if you see the berry, the mulberry, the most obvious or interesting thing is the berry, but the tiny little seed is not human scale. So then you ask the next question, are you woody and upright? And if you are, you take a cutting. Uh, number three is if it's not woody and upright, you can ask the next question, uh, are there a lot of little baby plants growing all around you? Uh, and if that's the case, as you can see in this picture, there's all these little baby plants growing all around. You can use plant division. And plant division really is as simple as 
pulling off one of those little baby plants, the roots and the leaves. Just pull a whole little plant off and plant it in a new location. So again, in a big clump like this, there's probably 20 plants in there. One clump can actually plant a lot more of a space, create from one kind of mature plant, you can get 20 or 30 plants that in a year or two will be just like that. So again, this is fast and abundant way of creating plants for free. After plant division, maybe there's it's not woody and upright, Maybe there's not a lot of little baby plants growing all around it. The next question is, are you falling over and making roots where you touch the ground? Now, maybe people have seen something like mint growing or these spider plants in the house. They fall over and wherever they touch the ground or touch some moisture, they make some roots on the node. So if the plant is falling over and making roots where it touches the ground, you can actually help it or just break off a little piece that has roots and shoots. And it looks just like plant division, but it's in a different, it's happening in a different way. So that's called layering. So if the plant is falling over and making roots where it touches the ground, like here, then each of these can become its own plant. You can cut it away from the mom plant and move it somewhere else. Um, number five, the last type of plant propagation is really, these should be done in order. If there's no fruit or flower or seed, if it's not woody and upright, if there's not a lot of little baby plants growing all around it, and if it's not falling over and making roots where it touches the ground, then the last question is, is there just not much happening above ground? If there's not much happening above ground, uh, that's a sign to look below and usually you'll find big old chunky roots and this is root division. So this, you see these plants, they don't have nodes, they don't have branching stems, they're not woody and upright. And sure enough, if you dig down below, they have these big chunks of root, and you can break off a piece of root and plant it. And so um, basically you can go out and explore all kinds of plants. You can walk through the forest and really just use this intuitive communication, stop in front of a plant. Hey, what's the most interesting thing about you? And the last time I'll repeat these. Is it a flower or fruit or a seed? If so, look for the seed. If there's no seed, then you go on. Are you woody and upright? And if the plant says, yes, I'm woody and upright, take a cutting, put it in a bag with soil and it'll probably grow. Maybe it's not woody and upright. And then you can ask, are there a lot of little baby plants growing all around you? And if not, are you falling over and making roots where you touch the ground? And if not that, then maybe it's telling you to look underground because there's probably a lot of stuff happening in the root zone. With that, you can let the earth speak beans and more. Um, so we have about three minutes. I see there's some questions, but I know we want to, uh, to, to wrap up at the hour. Um, so I just really, in, in just a few minutes, um, if, if you- if you want to take hey, a couple of those questions, that would be great. I've been looking them over and they're really excited to hear some answers. Yeah, please do. So please do. It. Yeah. Uh, you want me to take them? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> you don't want Perfect. to hear me yeah. do. <laughs> okay. So um, if you live somewhere where the season is really difficult to grow, like in Scotland, um, do you just leave the land over winter or should you still be managing it in some way um, based on what you want to do in the spring? Well, if the ground is frozen solid, there's not much you can do. Uh, the, the time to do the plant propagation is in the spring and the fall. So you can propagate plants in the early fall and get them into the ground in the late fall before it freezes. And the plant will go to sleep. And as long as it can tolerate the winter, it will bounce back in the, in the spring. But I would say that during the the really cold months, you want to let them, you want to kind of let it sit. If you're spreading fertilizer or planting a cover crop in your garden, or maybe planting garlic or parsley or something that's going to tolerate the winter and sprout in the spring, you want to get that done in the fall for sure. And again, propagating plants can be done in the spring and in the early fall, uh, but usually the summer and the winter are times to let the plants you already propagated grow or just lay dormant. Um, absolutely, can you do permaculture in a small space? Just what we went through, 
uh, I've known some people who didn't even have an outdoor garden, but they dedicate a small space in front of their window, in front of a, a sunny window, uh, and they get 50, 60, 80 little bags of plants and they start tomato plants and they start little fruit trees or grape starts. And then they give them out to their neighbors or they give them out to the school and they do that sort of thing. I would call that permaculture, absolutely. Uh, my first year when I lived in Rhode Island, I did that all through the fall. I propagated a ton of plants. I kept them warm in the winter. And in the spring, I had a garden in potted, pot, like in plant pots on my cement uh, parking lot. And people would pick peppers walking in and out of their the house and things like that. Um, so yes, you can do it anywhere on a balcony, on a terrace. You can fit a ton of diversity uh, into a small space. And plant propagation for sure is a great way to maximize small space. You can get, you can go to your your grandma's house and take a cutting of rosemary because it's woody and upright. You can go to your uncle's house and take a plant division of aloe because it has a lot of little baby plants growing all around it, you know? And so you can go on and on and start to look at these useful plants and have an intuition of how to propagate them, bring them back, just a little piece of it to your house on your balcony, propagate it, give them out to friends, use them as they grow big. Um, so uh, Kadri says, this is such a great memory refresh. Uh, doing the permaculture design course with you in Lake Atilan was probably one of the most influential courses I've ever taken and it still lives on. Thank you for the work. Thank you, Kadri. That's super nice. And I'm glad you did the promotional plug <laughs> so I didn't have to, <laughs> but thank That's you. Fun. It's awesome to hear from you. Wow. Um, Bradley, very inspiring. Um, is it possible to get a copy of Shad Slides? This is, will be, Teresa's giving me the thumbs up, so she, I think she'll tell us how, but it will be recorded, it is being recorded, will be available on YouTube. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone for all the attention. Hopefully you learned a little bit about permaculture and you got some tips for how to start propagating plants using your intuitions. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it back over to Teresa. Great. Thank you so much, Chad Gosey. Good see for your amazing presentation. You got lots of, someone was raising their hand a little bit earlier to say what a great job. And I uh, wanna thank you for doing this. Uh, at Wellkind, once again, we love to partner with organizations. One of our primary missions right now is to put gardens out there to really empower people to grow their own food, to know where it comes from, to know that it's healthy, to know that it's organic and that it's good for you. And so what Shad has been talking about are all the ways. And he, you know, I told Shad earlier, we're, we're kind of, you know, closing this out with a bang here, having come to the presentation, because this month long series, Seeds of Change, have been about planting your gardens, how to do that, how to feel better, how to live a life that is a lot more powerful, because you're in charge of some of these things. So once again, I want to thank you, Shat, and thank all of the other speakers. And to tell you, if you'd like more information, you can go to our website at wellkind.org. And also, we'll be putting Shad's presentation, the handout for that, in our um, link that we will send out after the presentation. So thank you. Okay, so once again, thank you for attending Seeds of Change with Wellkind. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody.